The title of today's message is Put Fear Where It Belongs. Um, being an assistant principal, there's a little bit of fear in what I do as, as I guess, the kids, the way they look at me. Now, I try really hard as an assistant principal, especially with the younger kids, when they see me, they'll see me in the hall, and they, uh, hi, Mr. Pupupada, you know, so they can't ever say my name right, but, and they'll start waving crazy, and some of them will run up to me, and so I try to train them really early on as kindergartners, the very beginning, is like, you don't, you don't have to wave like this, you don't have to, you don't have to make a big old, uh, you know, big old noise thing, because uh, we want you to be quiet in the hall, but all you got to do is just wave to me like this, just do a finger wave. And so you, if you're walking down the hall, you're just, you see little kids doing like this, and I'm like, you know, and so we kind of do that. But as you get older, the older kids, they start, you know, I walk into a room, and there's some kids that are just like kind of watching me. I walk in, and we're, we're open concept in Cypher, so I can walk in on one side of the building and walk all the way straight down two rooms, and, you know, I can sneak up on a kid. So it's not like I'm opening the door, and everyone turns to, open, to see who's coming through the door. I kind of like walk through, and it's like, uh, you know, kids just, they could be doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and they don't realize I'm right behind them. Or they're like, you know, I can't hear them, you know, that they're calling my name, and they're trying to warn everybody else around them that I'm there. But, you know, you have those kids that are just kind of like, you, they see you, and they're just like watching you all the way across the room, you know? And it's like, you know, like, are, are, you, are you here for me? You know, are you here for me? Like, I, I'll walk in, and so I'm, like, real careful. I, I'll go into a room, and I'm standing behind, and I'm like, is, is everything all right, Mr. Spot? I'm like, yeah, I'm just, buddy, I'm just checking out what you're doing. You know, I'm just checking out your work. You're doing good. You're showing your strategies. Good job, you know. And I'm very cognizant of the times when I go in there, and I do need to talk to a student, because a lot of the times we investigate, we're trying to figure out things. And so I'll go in, and, and uh, I'm very cognizant of my, of my facial expressions and how I look. And I'll go in, and I'm not, you know, I try to force my, this smile on, because I'm dealing with this thing that I don't want to be dealing with. But I force this smile on, like, hey, Miss so-and-so, can I talk to so, so-and-so? And they, they, they're like, everybody stops and looks, and they're like, oh, I just have a quick question for you. You know, I just need to ask you a question. And so they kind of know, okay, if Mr. Sepulveda is just saying that, then there's nothing, you know, he's looking into something else, you know, he's, he's got a question for me, I'm not the one who's in trouble. But there are times when I go in there, and I'm very straight-faced, because I do want to put a little bit of fear in kids. And so I do walk in there, I'm like, you know, like, oh my God. and so, you know, we're walking, and now... Sometimes I'll like go into an empty room or I'll go into the computer lab or I'll go into the, to the library because my office is so far down the road. But I want, sometimes I do want them to feel it, you know. And so we start walking and they're like, am I in trouble? Like, uh, we're going to talk in my office, you know. And I, uh, did I do something wrong? Well, let's just wait until we get to my office, you know. Because I want them to feel a little bit like, hey, I know that there's some things going on that shouldn't be going on. And so the last, the last couple of weeks, we've had um, some, some serious profanity in one of our uh, restrooms. And it's been driving the teachers crazy, and it's been driving us crazy because it's in the fifth and fourth grade area, but first grade goes there all the time. And so, of course, the minute that it's there, the, the kids are going and they tell the teachers, but, you know, until then, you know, we, our custodians have been going there and, and, and they have some powerful, powerful cleaners to be able to wipe all that stuff down. But it's, you know, we think about, okay, fifth graders, fourth graders, they're the oldest kids on campus, but they're still like 9, 10, 11 years old. And some of the profanity that's on there is like, oh my gosh, what is that? You know, what, is, what are these kids watching? What are they, what are they hearing? Uh, it's, it's crazy. And so... I, didn't, I haven't had a lot of time to, be, to look at the cameras. The cameras are, are great. But uh, the secretaries have been looking at the cameras, trying to narrow it down to see who, you know, who's been going to the restroom. And so they narrowed it down to this one kid who, like, right before it was, uh, it was told to the teachers, right before the custodian was called, that this student, this one student, two times went right before to the rest, that restroom. And so they're like, hey, this kid, you know, it, it's a good good, uh, you know, good chance that it's him. And we were like, all right, well, you know, they came like, do you want to talk to the student? Because he's my, he's, a, he's my grade level. And I'm like, well, I really don't have time. I'm dealing with this kindergartner, trying to turn him around, trying to get him back to class. And, you know, he wants to talk about Godzilla and, and whatever. And I'm just trying to get him to settle down to go back to class. And they're like, well, uh, well, I said, you know what, I'll tell you what, why don't you go get him? 
And I've never had anybody go do that before. I'm like, why don't you go get him? And why don't you drop him off in the front office? I'm like, okay. So she goes and, and she gets him and she comes back and goes, oh, he's sweating bullets. And I'm like, all right, well, that's, that's good. I mean, hopefully he's the one who really did it. And so I'm like, uh, she goes, are you ready for him right now? I'm like, no, I still have this student here. I said, I'll tell you what, give him an incident report. So we have this incident report where we want him to fill it out and give him a clipboard and a pencil and just say, Mr. Sepulveda, just got to be real serious with him. Mr. Sepulveda would like you to fill out what you know about the profanity in the restroom. And so she goes over there, and she's really serious with them. And the whole, she comes back, oh, yeah, we got him. We got him, Todd. You know, and so, you know, he finishes the incident report. And I'm just about finished with this kindergartner. And so I'm like, go ahead and bring him in. And so he comes in, I'm talking with this kindergartner. I'm like, okay, buddy, you got to go back to class. You got to be good. And so he leaves, and then I turn, and I'm like, okay. Get real serious. What can you tell me about the profanity in the restroom? Well, Mr. Sepulveda, I know I've gone in there and there's some really bad words and really bad language. And, and I told the teacher and, and, uh, and uh, I said, well, we've been looking at the video. And it just so happens that you have been in that restroom two times, you know, right before it happened. And he goes, this big fifth grader, he goes, oh, heavens, No. And I'm like, come on, fifth graders don't talk like that, you know? And so he, I, he's been, you know, and oh, heavens, no, I don't, wear, I don't take markers into the restroom. I'm like, who said it was a marker, buddy? Who said, you know, and whatever. And I'm like, so it, he didn't admit it, and we don't have cameras in, in the restroom. So I'm like, I'm hoping that he realizes, I'm like, well, we're watching the video cameras. And so you need them to know that if you happen to be in that restroom again, right before it gets, to, it gets reported, then, buddy, I mean, that's three times, all right? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Sepulveda. So I know he's going to go, and he's going to spread the word to fifth grade. Hey, they're watching the videos, and, or fourth grade, and they're, they're, they're watching the videos. And so, man, whoever's doing that's going to get caught. And so hope, hopefully they'll stop, because that's what we want to do. We don't, I don't want to punish kids. I just want them to stop that profanity and writing all over the restroom wall. So a little bit of fear is, is good. You know, putting a little bit of fear in place is good because it kind of keeps those students that, you know, are going to act up. Those students that have that propensity to like, oh, you know, I better be careful. I better, better watch it because there, there's always that opportunity that Mr. Sepulveda might be around the corner or they might call Mr. Sepulveda or I might get my parents called or whatever it might happen. And we have that a little bit too, right? We have, we, there's times where fear gets put inside of us. I mean, just like driving down the road and seeing a cop car and you might not, you know, you see a cop car on the side and they might even, they just, they're just there and they might not even have their laser out or anything like that. But you're driving and you see that cop car and what do you do? All of a sudden you take off the the gas and you start hitting the brake and you look down there's so many times I'm, I'm I'm like I'm old I don't speed anymore right so it's like I'm looking I'm like I'm not speeding what am I slowing down for why am I braking for right and it's like you just have that thing you see a cop and it's like oh man I'm doing something wrong I gotta fix it right I'm, like, it's like Mr. Sepulveda I see that I gotta fix it right and uh, you know the, the, weird, the crazy thing is when you're driving and you know you don't did, you didn't do anything wrong and all of a sudden, the cop lights start turning on. You're like, oh, my, what? I didn't do anything. Do I have a brake light out? Do I have? And so, you know, not too long ago, that happened to me. I started pulling over. The cop just, you know, passes me. He's getting somebody else, or he's going to a, he's going to a call or something like that. And we face that all the time, you know? You might get a call. You might go to the doctor's office, and, then, you know, they run some tests, and you get that call, and, like, uh, the doctor would like to see you. Like, oh, man, what is that? And you start going in your head. All kinds of things start happening. You're like, oh, do I have this? Do I have that? Do I have this? So, yeah, you get online and you hit, you know, you Google something, and that's the worst thing you can do because all of a sudden you're dying, right? Whatever happens, you're like, I got that symptom. I got that symptom. I got that symptom. I got that symptom. I have three months to live. Okay, I love you all, and, you know, this is what I want to do. This is my bucket list. And you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, everything's fine, you know? And, and I hate that, you know, when the doctor said, you know, like, hey, well, are they going to call me? And like, I just recently I did that, and the doctor, I, was, I had an electrocardiogram just to make sure that I was, you know, going to live. And uh, I, I go, like, well, the doctor, you know, we'll schedule a visit for you. And I'm like, well, okay, so, like, does the doctor schedule a visit regardless? Or, you know, are they just going to call me and say everything is great? And she goes, no, no, you're, you're fine. If you, 
If, if there was uh, an issue, you wouldn't be allowed to leave here. You would go, like, to the hospital. I'm like, great. So, yeah, I show up at the doctor. And I'm like, I pay this money for him to say, hey, everything looks good. You check out. All right, you know. And so we go through those kinds of things, and our mind starts running away with us. And we have times in our lives where we begin to fear, and that's not, that's not great, right? Because fear does, starts doing a number on us. And so we have that in our lives. And on top of all the things that we deal with on a regular basis, so like we, we fear, you know, we have relationship issues that we're dealing with. We have financial issues that we're dealing with. We have, you know, health issues that we deal with, that there's always that propensity to fear and for it to wreck our mind. But you throw on top of that all the other things that are happening in the world, right? And I've shared with you all before some of the reasons why this political time it's so chaotic and so crazy it's because people are a little worried. People are a little fed up with the way the world is. And so they're saying, hey, we're tired of politicians the way, you know, they are and, and what they've done so far. So let's go and let's look at somebody who's an outsider. And so we're starting to see a little bit of that. Confidence in our political system is starting to wane. You hear about things in the economy. So on top of all the other stuff, things like oh, about the economy are going and you, oil goes down. And, you know, we, we've been very blessed here in Texas because we've been able to, to uh, you know, our, our income, our economy has been really good up until recently when oil started crashing. And you're hearing about people losing their jobs and in the oil fields and all that kind of stuff and oil companies. And, and uh, I know that, you know, that, that's touched some of the people that I know, like we, that I work with. Their, their husbands are, you know, have the, have the um, they, they either are on the verge of losing their job or it's kind of like they've been told, you've got to step it up. You've got to do the work of three or four people now because uh, you're in the seniority role, but everybody else is going to be let go below you. And so we have that. We've got the Zika virus, right? So you're like, oh my gosh, the Zika virus is going to attack us and it's going to, to kill everyone and don't have a baby because the Zika virus is going to, is going to do us in. And then, so we have that. And, you know, it was, it was what was it last year? It was Ebola. Y'all remember all that? I mean, because I, because I run around a little bit in the alternative news scene because of my website. I'm, I'm, I'm reading all those kinds of things, and early on, I would see some of those things, and I would start to freak out, man. I would start to panic. But now it's kind of like, oh, uh, it's kind of like in Men in Black. Remember in Men in Black when they were like, uh, you know, Will Smith's um, character, like he was worried because the world was going to be, dis Earth, Earth was going to be destroyed. And then um, the other guy was like, uh, Kay was like, and it, the world's going to be destroyed every single day. There's something, right? Every single day, every single summer. So last year it was Ebola, and everybody was freaking out about Ebola. And people were saying, don't, don't go outside of your house because you can get Ebola, and you can kill your whole family. And, and before that, it was swine flu. Remember that? And so we were all going to die, and there was going to be a pandemic because of swine flu. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I think it's scary. We're overdue for a pandemic that could really, really do some damage. But I think we've got to be careful. There's always something. You know, last summer, too, we had, uh, with the Ebola thing, and then we had Jade Helm. Uh, people were hit, people that, that know that I kind of deal with the alternative news scene and the preparedness scene were hitting me up on Facebook, like, Todd, what do you think about this Jade Helm thing? And I'm like, I, I don't. You know, I'm like, you know, keep an eye on it, whatever. It didn't help that, you know, Governor Abbott kind of, you know, like, hey, we're going to be monitoring the military. And, you know, that kind of freaked people out. There was one person that came, that asked me, he goes, we are planning our vacation during Jade Helm. Should I cancel that? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, no. You know, if, if things happen, I'm sure you'll be fine. Don't worry. You know, nothing's going to happen. This is just normal stuff. People were freaking out. Then you had, you know, 2012. Oh, my gosh. 2012 was good for my website because starting in October, boom. People, I mean, people were going crazy, but you got 2012. You, got, you had the Mayan, the Mayan calendar thing. You had Y2K. Do you realize that Y2K, there was people, I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. So there's always that opportunity to fear. 
There's always something that we can fear. There's always something that's out there looming. There's always a boogeyman. There's always, there's always something that's coming around the corner that will get you all tied up in knots and worried about what's happening. And you know what? For a Christian, what is our response to that? For a Christian, how are we supposed to handle that? And how are we supposed to deal with that? When everybody around us is fearing and everybody else is going through things, what, what is it? Because you know that there are some Christians that when the poop hits the fan, that they forget that they're going to be, that they're Christians. And I, my, my thing has been, no. Like when the poop hits the fan, like they're going to load up on their ARs and they're going to be behind, you know, behind, you know, barricades and people like, you know, no one is going to be allowed to come into my house or go out or, or this or that. And I'm like, where's God in that? Because if you're a Christian, you know, now we're supposed to go out into the world and, and you know, we, we go out and, and to the nations and, and people should be getting saved and we should be out there ministering to people. And then all of a sudden the poop hits the fan and all that goes out. You never see that in the Bible. We continue to minister and be, be, continue to preach the gospel. That's when people are going to need us the most if that ever happens here in this, in this earth, in this world. So how do we manage this fear thing? <clears throat> I do think that there are some things that we need to be aware of. I do think that we need to keep our eyes open. You know, they came to Jesus at one time and they said, Hey, um, give us a sign. You know? And, you know, what did he say? He said this. <clears throat> when evening comes, you say it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. Jesus said, hey, you need to know the signs of the times. You need to be aware. You need to be aware of what's going on. Because, I, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rulers of that time had the Son of God right in front of them. And it just, they missed them. Because they, weren't, they were looking at things from a whole different perspective. And I think that's the saddest thing in the world. I would not want to miss God. I would not want to miss the second coming. I would not want to miss a move of God because I was thinking it had to come over here. So in that regard, in that case, we do need to be aware. We do, we do need to be out there and looking and making sure that we see the things that are happening and we're able to respond to those things and be able to help people understand and be able to point them to a loving Savior. So one of the things that I think happens one of the things that does bring a little bit of fear to people are the end times. And I've talked about it before, but I'm very disappointed that a lot of churches back away from talking about the end times. A lot of, a lot of churches, in, in two reasons, because one, it, it's, it's unknown. It kind of freaks people out, right? It's kind of like, it's like, hey, start talking. <laughs> there was this girl, one time I was working with her, and, and uh, I was really, really young, and this back then, I was kind of into all the end time stuff, and uh, it, it was very, very slow, so we were able to talk. There was no work for us to do, so they just kind of allowed us just to kind of hang out and talk, and we were talking, and we we're talking about the end times. We we're talking about what that all looked like. And the next day she came and she goes, look, look at me. Look at me. Do you see this? I'm like, what? What's going on? The bag's under my eyes. I could not sleep because of what you told me yesterday. And I'm like, that's not, you know, that's not how we need to do things. We don't have to worry and fear so much. But we do need, do need to pay attention about the last time, the last days. You know, there's a lot of confusion about that. And I don't claim to be an expert. But a good percentage, over a quarter percentage of the Bible talks about prophecy, talks about the end times. So it's something that we should talk about. So I, I do want to look at Matthew chapter 10. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go back there. So if you would turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look at a scripture there. A couple of verses. <clears throat> that are relevant to us today. Talking about fear. And we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to start off in verse 16. Because in this last days, one of the things that kind of makes Christians fearful is that there's going to be persecution. 
And nobody likes to the idea of being persecuted. We've seen the movies. We've heard what could happen. But this is what the Bible says, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Look, I'm, this is Jesus speaking. Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as harmless as doves. Because people will hand you over to Sanhedrins and flog you in their synagogues. Beware of them. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and to the nations. But when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you should speak. For you will be given what to say at that hour. Because you are not speaking, but the spirit of your father is speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. Children will even rise up against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. When they persecute you in one town, escape to another. For I assure you, you will not have covered the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. It is enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? It's kind of scary. Jesus is talking about you're going to be persecuted. That you are going to be flogged and you're going to, brother is, is going to turn against brother and, and father against son. And that's a scary thing to be thinking about those kinds of things. Right? Um, Jesus said, that the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep, they will also keep yours. We are on unprecedented time right now in history because we have experienced a lot of God's grace and mercy in this, in this world, in this earth, in this country. But I tell you what, there are people in, uh, on earth being persecuted right now, being persecuted greatly. Now, Jesus right here, when we looked at Matthew chapter 10, was talking about, Jesus was talking about the disciples at that time, right? The thing about prophecy is that it's cyclical. It's not linear. It's not like we like, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. It's cyclical. So it kind of circles back around, and, but it's not exactly the same. So let me give you, let me give you a, uh, an example. When Jesus talks about, hey, when the abomination of desolation happens, then you see this happening, then you need to run for the mountains. Now, a lot of people look at that scripture, and they look at that. That is a future thing that is going to be happening and so that you need, to be, you need to be thinking about that. But in 70 AD, when, when the temple was being destroyed at that time, th there was a man who remembered what Jesus had said. And he said, wait a minute. The abomination of desolation, this, this guy is offering a pig on the, on the temple altar. He's desolating the temple altar. Let's, you know what? He grabbed a lot of people, and they went out to the mountains. And he saved a lot of people because he remembered what Jesus said. Now, that... that Scripture, that prophecy, people believe it's for the future, but it worked there in 70 AD. A lot of the times we look at things and we look at it from our Western perspective and we like, we try to look at Scripture from our Western, Western perspective and God says, you know what, <laughs> this is Jerusalem, this is uh, Judah, this is Israel, this is centered. It is not American-centered or Western-centered. And we try to dissect Scripture to make it fit what we want and God says, no, this is the way it goes. And so Jesus is saying, here, they're going to persecute you, disciples, but, and you just know that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. But then he looks to us and he says, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. There's going to be a time when we will be persecuted. And how do we manage that? Are we like so faithful that when that happens that we're going to be able to stand and say, all right, I'm being persecuted. Or are we going to be so scared when that happens that it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't know if I can go, if I don't know if I can be persecuted. I don't know if I could, if I could uh, you know, die for my faith if it, if it 
consisted of that. And that's a scary thing. And Christians begin to be fearful of that. And we talk about that in, in churches. People don't want to hear that. People are like, I ain't going back there again. That, that preacher's talking about, you know, the end times and dying. And I, don't, I just want to feel good. I just want to get an inspiring message so I'm ready to go on Monday. I want my best life ever. And I want to be able to like, hey, praise the Lord, and that's it. Not thinking about these things. Well, you know what? If you're not thinking about these things, if you're not prepared for these things, when they come, you're not going to be ready to go. Scary thought. Scary thought. Let's see here. The reason I'm talking about this, one of the things kind of God started working with me on is I received an email. I get a lot of emails, but this email was from a ministry that I, uh, that I respect. And so I decided to go ahead and read it. And it was, all it was, it wasn't even asking for money. It wasn't doing any of that. It was talking about, uh, it, was, it, was, it was sharing a letter from Corey Tin Boom uh, from 1974. And I read it and just God started working with me and dealing with me on it. And I shared it out. And people were like responding to it. Corey Tin Boom was, uh, lived during World War II. They lived in Amsterdam. And they, um, her family hid Jews. They were Christian, but they hid Jews. So there's, uh, I've never really, I, I know the name. I don't really know too much of it. When I started looking up, I found this, this uh, scripture. Somebody had made this, this meme. It says, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sour, sorrows. It empties today of its strength. And I'm like, man, that's a, that's a good saying there. But uh, I was reading it. And it was very inspir inspiring. Let me get to it really quick here. I, um, so she was, uh, her family hid Jews. There's a, there's a book, and I think there's even a movie, I'm going to look it up, called The Hiding Place, because they slowly but surely brought materials into their home to create a false wall. So when they were hiding Jews, the Jews could go back there and they could hide. And, uh, but eventually they got found out. And so all her family was uh, sent off to concentration camps. And, uh, of course, things happened while they were there. So what I want to do is I want to read a letter that she wrote in 1974, okay? Now, they always say, when you're preaching, when you're up there, don't read. It's not good. But I thought it'd be better if I read her words than if I tried to um, just kind of go from, from what I, I remembered. So bear with me here. The world is deathly ill. It is dying. The great physician has already signed the death certificate. Yet there is still a great work for Christians to do. They are, they are to be streams of living water, channels of mercy to those who are still in the world. It is possible for them to do this because they are overcomers. Christians are ambassadors for Christ. They are representatives from heaven to this dying world. And because of our presence here, things will change. My sister Betsy and I were in the Nazi concentration camp at Ravensbrück because we committed the crime of loving Jews. 700 of us from Holland, France, Russia, Poland, and Belgium were herded into a room built for 200. As far as I knew, Betsy and I were the only two representatives of heaven in that room. We may have been the Lord's only representatives in that place of hatred, yet because of our presence there, things changed. Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We too are to be overcomers, bringing the light of Jesus into a world filled with darkness and hate. Sometimes I get frightened as I read the Bible and I, as I look into this world and see all of the tribulation and persecution promised by the Bible coming true. Now I can tell you, though, if you are to be afraid, if you, if you, are too, if you, you too are afraid, then I have just read the last pages. I can now come to shouting hallelujah, hallelujah, for I have found where it is written that Jesus said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is the future and hope of this world. Not that the world will survive, but that we shall be overcomers in the midst of a dying world. Betsy and I in the concentration camp prayed that God would heal Betsy, who was so weak and sick. Yes, the Lord will heal me, Betsy said with confidence. She died the next day, and I could not understand it. They laid her thin body on the concrete floor along with all the other corpses of the women who died that day. It was hard for me to understand, to believe that God had a purpose for all that 
Yet, because of Betsy's death, today I'm traveling all over the world telling people about Jesus. There are some among us teaching that will be, there are some among us teaching there will be no tribulation, that the Christian will be able to escape all this. These are the false teachers that Jesus was warning us to expect in the latter days. Most of them have little knowledge of what is already going on across the world. I have been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you will be translated, raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribu tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. I feel I have a divine mandate to go and tell the people of this world that it is possible to be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in training for the tribulation, but more than 60% of the body of Christ across the world has already entered into this tribulation. There is no way to escape it. We are next. Since I have already gone through prison for Jesus' sake, and since I met the bishop in China, now every time I read a good Bible text, I think, hey, I can use that in the time of tribulation. Then I write it down and learn it by heart. When I was in the concentration camp, a camp where only 20% of the women came out alive, we tried to cheer each other up by saying, nothing can be worse, nothing could be any worse than today. But we would find the next day was even worse. During this time, a Bible verse that I had committed to memory gave me great hope and joy. If ye be repro reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part evil is spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. 1 Peter 3.14 I found myself saying hallelujah, because I am suffering, Jesus is glorified. In America, the church seeing, let the congregation escape tribulation, but in China and Africa, the tribulation has already arrived. The last year alone, more than 200,000 Christians were martyred in Africa. Now, things like that never get into the newspapers because they cause bad political relations, but I know I have been there. We need to think about that when we sit down in our nice homes, houses with our nice clothes to eat our steak dinners. Many, many members of the body of Christ are being tortured to death at this very moment. Yet we continue to write on as though we are all going to escape the tribulation. Several years ago, I was in Africa in a nation where a new government had come into power. The first night I was there, some of the Christians were commanded to come to the police station to register. When they arrived, they were arrested, and the same night they were executed. The next day, the same thing happened with other Christians. The third day, it was the same. All the Christians in the district were being systematically murdered. The fourth day, I was to speak in a little church. The people came, but they were filled with fear and tension. All during the service, they were looking at each other, their eyes asking, Will this one I am sitting beside be the next one killed? Will I be the next one? The room was hot and stuffy with insects that came through the screenless window and swirled around the naked bulbs over the bare wooden benches. I told them a story out of my childhood. When I was a little girl, I said, I went to my father and said, Daddy, I am afraid that I will never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, said father, when you take a trip, a train trip to Amsterdam, when do I give you the money for that ticket? Three weeks before? No, Daddy. You give me the money for the ticket just before we get on the train. That is right, my father said, and so it is with God's strength. Our Father in heaven knows when you will need the strength to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. He will supply all you need just in time. My African friends were nodding and smiling. Suddenly a spirit of joy descended upon the church, and the people began to sing. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Later that, later that week, half the congregation of the church was executed. I heard later that the other half was killed some months ago. But I must tell you something. I was so happy that the Lord used me to encourage these people. For unlike many of their leaders, I had the word of God. I had been to the Bible and discovered that Jesus said he had not only overcome the world, but to all those who remained faithful to the end, he would give a crown of life. How can we get ready for the persecution? First, we need to feed on the word of God, digest it, make it part of our being. This will mean disciplined Bible study each day as we not only memorize long passages of Scripture but put the principles to work in our lives. Next, we need to develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just the Jesus of yesterday, but Jesus of history, but the, li the, Jesus of history, but the life-changing Jesus of today who is still alive and sitting at the right hand of God. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
There is no optional command of the Bible. It is absolutely necessary. Those earthly disciples could never have stood up under the persecution of the Jews and Romans had they not waited for Pentecost. Each of us needs our own personal Pentecost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We will never be able to stand in the tribulation without it. In the coming persecution, we, we must be ready to help each other and encourage each other, but we must not wait until the tribulation comes before starting. The fruit of the Spirit should be the dominant force of every Christian life. Many are fearful of the coming tribulation. They want to run. I, too, am a little bit afraid when I think that after all my 80 years, including the horrible Nazi concentration camp, that I might have to go through the tribulation also. But then I read the Bible and I am glad. When I am weak, then I shall be strong, the Bible says. Betsy and I were prisoners for the Lord. We were so weak, but we got power because the Holy Spirit was on us. That mighty inner strengthening of the Holy Spirit helped us through. No, you will not be strong in yourself when the tribulation comes. Rather, you will be strong in the power of Him who will not forsake you. For 76 years I have known the Lord, and not once has He ever left me or let me down. Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. For I know that all to who overcome, He shall give the crown of life. Hallelujah. What amazing faith to be able to do that, to be able to be able to minister to other people in, the, in those times. But you notice that you have to be ready. Isaiah 51, let's do this. Let's continue reading that scripture in Matthew. Because how do we deal with this? And Corey Ten Booms in her letter gave us a little bit more, but I want to just talk about this. Because <clears throat> after Jesus is talking about the persecution in verse 26 he says this therefore don't be afraid of them since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known you get that jesus says don't be worried about the tribulation don't be afraid of the tribulation don't be afraid that if you're getting tortured you know there's uh, if you ever are looking for something to read chuck swindoll has done some biographies of some of the great men of faith and one of them was paul and i really I, at the end, it's great, great reading, and you could probably go to Half Price Books. I always see them at Half Price Books, and you can get them there. And it's great reading, uh, just it, to be inspired. But at the very end, of course, you know, there's, we don't really know for sure, but um, at the very end, he has Paul walking to be executed. They, they come and say, hey, you're about to get executed. And so he's walking, and where everybody else would be like, oh, man, you know, I don't want to be executed. I'm afraid. I'm, you know, one of the things that Chuck Swindoll says is that, you could look at Paul and he had a little smile on his face because he knew this was it. He knew what death here on this earth meant. And that's like, Jesus is like, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid if that was to happen. Let's continue reading. Verse 27, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted. Don't be afraid, therefore, you are worth more than many sparrows. I think that's so awesome. How do we handle this persecution? How do we, how do, we do that? Don't be afraid of them. Don't fear man. Instead, fear God. Fear the one that can not just kill your body, but kill the soul. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. In Isaiah 51, 12, it says, I, I am the one who confronts you. Who are you that you should fear man who dies, or a son of man who is given up like grass? Why, why would you fear man? Why would you fear the things of man? Why wouldn't you instead fear the things of God? And allow God to move in you and allow God to be your strength and your source. <clears throat> we need to put fear where it belongs. Not the fear of man. Not the fear of the things that might be happening in our world. Not the fear of whatever is going on and worrying all this that we, you know, we worry about. But instead putting in the fear of God. Like God, you are in control. I fear not allowing God to move in my life. 
I fear not being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit says, Todd, I want you to go over here, or I want you to go over here, or Todd, I want you to, to spend a little money here, or I want you to bless this person over here, or Todd, I want you to stop what you're doing and give that up, and I want you to pray and seek me. That's where we should be. And that's where we come, we should be now. Not when we think we're going to need it. Not in the future when like, oh yeah, we'll get there someday. You do that now. <clears throat> I want to close out with, um, I want to close out with uh, a scripture, or actually just kind of a story. I'm, I'm not going to read it all, but I'll just kind of relate some of it. I've been in, hanging out in Second Chronicles and uh, I've been reading the story of Jehoshaphat. And there's, I'll just blast through this really quick. You don't need to turn there. But later on, if you want to, you can read it in Second Chronicles chapter 20. <clears throat> so I'm going to blast through a little bit of this. So just bear with me here. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, together with some of the Muonites, came to fight against Jehoshaphat. People came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast number from beyond the Dead Sea and from, from Edom has come to fight against you. And they are already in Hazan, Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. It's kind of scary, right? Okay, I'm just minding my own business. I'm just hanging out here in Jerusalem, worshiping God and all that good stuff. And people are like, hey, there's a vast army. The Ammonites, the Moabites, all these ites are coming against you. And you know what? You don't have a whole lot of time to prepare because they're already here in En Gedi. And they're coming after you. And so Jehoshaphat doesn't go, okay, um, that's, we, you know, we're in Jerusalem. Let's go ahead and, and shut the gates and all that kind of stuff. Look what he did, verse 3. Jehoshaphat was afraid, so he resolved to seek the Lord. So he proclaimed a fast for all Judah, who gathered to seek the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek him. You think there's a little bit of fear in the people? You think like, hey, this vast army is coming, and you know what? They're not coming just to like say hi. They're not coming just to say, hey, can we have a little bit of your gold or a little bit of your silver? They're coming to destroy. This is an army to destroy. It's humongous. And so like Jehoshaphat calls a fast. He's like, hey, let's seek God. And people are coming and streaming in from all over the place, from all over the cities, and they're coming in, and they're joining in. Jehoshaphat prays. Verse 13, all Judah was standing before the Lord, look at this, with their infants, their wives, and their children. There was some fear here. Can you imagine? I mean, in those days, there's no big military army, there's no nukes, there's no other, you know, it's like, hey, when people, when people came against it, they got into that city, they were going to wipe everybody out. So men were coming to seek God, and, and, and women were coming, and they were holding their babies. And they were seeking God and fasting, you know, not eating. They were, they were just completely like, hey, we're going to seek God on this. In the midst of the congregation, the Spirit of the Lord came on Jezeel. And he said, listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of, inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast multitude. For the battle was not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. You will see them coming up the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the valley facing the wilderness of Jeruel. You do not have to fight this battle. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow go out to face them for the Lord is with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the, inhabitant, the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord to worship him. Then the Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and uh, in the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel, shouting in a loud voice. So they do that. Next day, they worship God there, but the next day they get up like God commanded and like the prophet said. And they, and they get ready to go out and they start singing. It says here, give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. And Jehoshaphat puts singers in the front and they get up to this place, right? It says, when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were corpses lying on the ground. Nobody had escaped. Then Jehoshaphat and his people went to gather the plunder. 
they found among them an abundance of goods on the bodies and valuable items. So they stripped them until nobody could carry any more. They were gathering the plunder for three days because there was so much. Wow. For three days, it was like, we're just gathering the plunder. They didn't have to lift a finger. All they did was trust in God. All they did was believe in God. All they did was have faith in that moment when they, when, when they listened to God and God moved mightily in their, in their lives. But here's the key. Right? In verse 3a, Jehoshaphat was afraid and he resolved to seek the Lord. What do you do when you fear? Do you freak out? you Google, you call a thousand people, you run out and try to find someone so you can hear an encouraging word. Jehoshaphat was afraid, but he resolved to seek the Lord. Now, that does not happen when you are a person of little faith. That happened because Jehoshaphat had a history of seeking God. Jehoshaphat lived in a time where he would worship God and seek God and he would go to God. He, li he, he valued the things of God, the presence of God. So when it came to a time where he needed God, it wasn't like, what do I do? Let me consult all my uh, officials. Let me consult all these people. Let me get some wise counsel here. It was like, no, I know exactly what I need to do. I'm afraid and I'm fearful and I'm scared and I'm scared for my people and I'm scared for my wife and my kids and all these people that God has given me in this kingdom. But I'm going to resolve to seek the Lord. People of Israel come together. Come in from the building, from outside, from the cities. Come and let's worship God in His presence. And let's fast. And let's give up. And bring your wives and your children. And, and, and cry and weep. And maybe God will answer us. And that only comes from a life of seeking God. That's why right now, this is the time where we're seeking God. We can't play games. This is the time right now where we're, 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 we're strengthening ourselves. Like Corey Ten Boom says, hey, I put words of, of God inside of me, scriptures inside of me, so when the, when the need comes, that it's there. Put the word of God. I learned a long time ago when I was a kid, put the word of God inside of you when you don't need it, so it will be there when you do need it. So there's going to be a time when we're fearful. There's going to be a time, there might be a time right now where you're fearful. You might be going through things right now that you're not sure how it's going to be. And you can do a number of things. But doing the thing that Jehoshaphat did, that's what's going to get you the real result. Everything else is a band-aid. Everything else is, a, you know, hey, putting it off. Everything else is temporary. You never know how God is going to move. And you know what? God always does something different than what you think He's going to do. He always blows you away. It always comes from the like, oh, just like the people, just like the rulers in Jesus' day. Oh, well, the Messiah is going to come like this. No, God said the Messiah is going to come like this. So where are you today? Are you fearful? Are you worried? Are you giving yourself over to the times when you think, you just like I'm thinking, it's like, oh my gosh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Instead of saying, God, let me seek you. Let me seek your face. Let me resolve to seek God. God will never leave you or forsake you. He will always come to be there with you. So let me ask you this. Are you fearful today? Stop. Stop being, don't, okay, be afraid. But put fear where it's supposed to be. Give it to God. Let God move in your life.
Are you playing games with God? If you are, stop. Give your life over completely. Start seeking God. Start praying and, and, and fasting and reading the Bible and seeing what God has in store for you. Do it now. Because God has a plan for your life. And maybe it's all the way through to the persecution and, and, and all of that stuff. And maybe you're going to die tomorrow. Right? No one knows what they have. No, no one knows how long they have. But you do know that you can worship a God and live for God for the time that you have here. And it has eternal repercussions. Here we are, 2016, reading a, a letter from 1974 about how God was moving. Just think about what God wants to do in your life right now and how the things that you do, these, this one little act of whatever you do, how it can affect the future.